So I want to teach you a traditional Darwin greeting. So normally here in Australia or even anywhere else in the world except for Darwin, you could get someone's attention by going, excuse me, excuse me, sorry, excuse me, and they will stop and they will turn around. Not in Darwin. In Darwin, they just keep going. They just keep walking. So you have to say this one phrase. And when you say this one phrase, they stop and they turn around and they acknowledge you. So I want to teach you this one phrase. The phrase is important. It's, the spelling is really important. So let me spell it out for you. It's spelled W-O-I-I-B-R-U. S, 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 exclamation mark. And the punctuation is very important. And it's pronounced Woibras. So I want you guys to all stand up and let's try this. Yes, this is going to be one of those presentations. <laughs> okay, so on the count of three, we're all going to scream out Woibras, all right? One, two, three. Oh, that's beautiful. But you know what? We're in all in business here or soon to be in business or interested in business and We've got to take it to the next level, all right? So let's give it another shot. And the way to do it is from your belly. Take a deep breath in and go, way bras, all right? So one, <laughs> like in business, some jump in early. <laughs> so here we go. One, two, three. Oh, that's beautiful, Gito. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's begin. I want to kick off this conversation with you today about talking about this idea of what it is to be an entrepreneur, the path to possibilities. I, I cannot purely articulate what entrepreneurship has done to my life. I used to be white before I became an entrepreneur. Just kidding. Um, so, so it has changed my life in so many different ways, right? And entrepreneurship isn't necessarily about starting a business per se. It's about thinking differently. And that's what today's session is all about, helping you to think differently. Now, why the hell would you want to think differently? Let me show you the power of this. We're going to play a game, OK? I'm going to play a game, and it's called What's in the Bag? And it's one of my favorite games. All right. Can anyone see the bag? Yep, good. All right. Now, you have to work with me here. We're going to be metaphorical about this, not literal. So I want you to use your imagination. And this is a bag. And it's a bag in a car park. And there's no one else around in this car park but this black bag. And it's just sitting there by itself. Inside the bag is about 10 kilos of high-grade quality cocaine. And there's no one else around. Now, what do you think if, let's say, a six-year-old kid comes over to the bag, opens it up, and finds? What do you think a six-year-old kid would think? White powder, yeah. sand, sugar, great. Now, what happens if, let's say, um, a normal adult, an average everyday adult, comes in, has a look inside the bag? What do you think they see? Yep, water test, yeah, cool. Are you part of scientists? <laughs> Just enthusiasm. What else? Powder. Yeah, they could get an idea that it might be drugs, right. What about, what about a priest comes in and has a look? What do you think the priest is thinking? Hey? Oh, OMG. <laughs> I've never had that. What else? A priest comes in, has a look at the bag. Drugs, something. Yeah, cool. Yeah, awesome, right? Um, okay, now, let's say a cop comes in, an honest cop. What do you think the honest cop is looking? It's not right. What else? Who's the owner? Right, because they might be thinking, oh, it's drugs. I'm going to catch the owner, right? What happens if a drug dealer comes in and has a look at the bag? Lotterly. Yeah, cool. Yeah. <laughs> He's going to try it first. Yeah. Now, my question to you is out of all of these different experiences, what is the truth? It's a what? It's the same bag. Yep. How you look at it. Right. And that is the truth. So the bare truth is it's a bag in a car park full of drugs. No one can dispute that right? But you notice how there's different perceptions 
based on experiences, knowledge, whatever you read that morning, the mood that you're in. And that is how I see things as entrepreneurship. I look at the world completely differently to most people out there. And that's what I call this notion of being an entrepreneur. So let me go in deeper to that concept for a second. So as an entrepreneur, let me, let me rewind a second here. Right? Let me take you back to a misconception about entrepreneurship. A lot of people think entrepreneurship is about starting a business and making money. No, there's so much more to it. And the reason how I discovered this was that Ben told you a little bit about my story, which is when I was growing up in Darwin, uh, I, I achieved a lot of stuff. I didn't put it in the bio because it's a bit boring to, to read, but if you look up me online, you'll see all of my achievements. And the reason why I achieved all that stuff was because I was bored, <laughs> right? Darwin's a beautiful town, but there's not much happening there if you actually want to do stuff. So I've grown up in my life always looking at how things can be done. So I was always interested in business. I can't really remember why or how I got into business, but I've always had this curiosity. And I came from a very negative environment. So my parents, um, much like most of us here today, they wanted their children to study hard, get a good job, you know, then get a second job, maybe get married. Does anyone relate to that? Yeah, right. So I, I failed at all <laughs> that stuff, right? Um, and, and my dad was very hard on me. And he was always like, uh, because I couldn't get the required grades, which is like, as you know, top of the class, you have to be top of the class, otherwise you're useless, right? So my dad was very hard on me. He didn't, uh, every day of my life, he was made, made me feel like I was worthless, simply because I couldn't get the A. Now, the world has changed. Uh, and now a lot of kids still go through that, but a lot of kids don't. Uh, but when I was growing up, you know, can you imagine every day of your life being made, to, being made to feel like a failure? So what I would do is I would hide in my room and then, you know, explore on the interwebs and see all these amazing things happening. And so I got deeply curious and, and that curiosity expanded into business. So I remember uh, one conversation I had with my dad. Um, and it was, I was at the kitchen table, I was about 15 years old, I'd, I'd just started my web design business. Um, he just saw me as playing on the computer, whatever, and uh, 15 years old, and he came up to me and goes, right, time to get serious, right, what do you want to do when you, when you graduate, tell me. And I said to him, Dad, I want to be like Bill Gates. And then he, he looked at me and he goes, you? You can't be anything, you know, you're useless, you think you're like Bill Gates, what makes you think that? And I said, well, why not? He goes, don't waste my time. You know, and that conversation stuck in my head, right? Because that's the moment for those of you who have children, right? And they come to you and say, like, this is what I want to do. But based on your perception of the world and how you think, you will either enhance that child's ability to blossom or you will kill it. It's a crucial pivot. That was my pivotal moment. And Throughout my whole life, when my dad was alive, he would always remind me of what a failure I was because I couldn't get an A. And I would look at other things online. I'd say, well, hang on. These guys, Bill Gates didn't get an A. Richard Branson didn't get an A, right? So I saw a different world than what my dad saw. But as a kid, you don't know anything, right? So I had this feeling inside of me, and that has just expanded out throughout my career. And that's what it means to be an entrepreneur. Now... When I, um, so long story short, I, I graduated from uni, I'm a Monash graduate, now, I know we're in Melbourne University, so <laughs> blessings please, um, and I went to university and got a job, uh, gentlemen, come in, hi, how are you? No, nope, don't apologise, it's fine, grab yourself a seat, join this amazing group of people. Um, so yeah, so I came into, came into uni, graduated, got a top job, got an amazing boss, and then as the company grew, my boss uh, changed over, and uh, the second in command uh, was a very different personality. And being a Sri Lankan, I, I come from a very subservient culture. Respect your elders, don't question your elders. Um, you know, if someone more powerful comes in, serve them. Um, my boss, I was very keen to serve him because he could rise my career. Right? So he walked in the door and I went up to him and I said, excuse me, boss, you know, well, didn't call him boss, but for the story, right? Um, excuse me, so glad you're here. 
um, you know, do you need anything? And he goes, yeah, I'd, I'd love my computer set up. I was like, sure, no worries. So I went and got the computer set it all up because I'd been building computers as a kid. I knew how to set everything up, right? And plugged it all in and, uh, you know, set him up. Now, in my mind, I had done something good for him. And I thought, you know what? I've built this relationship with him, right? And this has got to skyrocket my career, you know, because I was a... I was a Another story. But uh, I was a business analyst looking to be a project manager. And uh, so in my mind, my perception, I'd done something good. In his mind, he was thinking, I've got my IT tech support sorted. And that carried me throughout my career. Because whenever opportunities come up, I was never allowed into it. And uh, because I'm just tech support, what would I know? It doesn't matter about what I've achieved. You know, I'm just tech support. Perception. So it got to a point, and again, another pivotal moment for me, where he came to see me one day. Well, he was putting everyone on, the, uh, on this course, a training course. Uh, it was a basic training course in, um, is anyone in IT here? Yep, a few people. Do you guys know what Crystal Reports is? Yeah, 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 yeah. right. So it's a reporting tool, right? So um, when I started, uh, the boss came in and he said, right, I'm putting everyone on a training Crystal Reports tool. Um, everyone has to attend this mandatory, right? And now my fellow programmer, uh, he said, you know what? I don't need to do this. I've got, I've got experience, you know? So he was fine. Boss let him off. And then I said, you know what? I've, I've got the same experience because my reports are being used in government. So I can prove that I, I can do this stuff. Why would I need a training course, right? And he said, all right, sure, no worries. Now, Back in those days, I used to work long hours. All my friends would clock in at 8 o'clock and clock out at, you know, 4.21, long story, Darwin time. And uh, I would be there sometimes till 6, 7 o'clock working. I was always the first one in the office and the last one to leave, right, just because of me. So when everyone else had left, my boss came and saw me, and he had a private chat to me. And he said, listen, I want you to rethink this. And I said, well, why? I've got stuff out there. It's, you know, I can do this stuff. You know, you let Gerhard go, and he said, Gerhard's got a little more experience than you. And I was like, all right, well, I'll think about it. So I went home, thought about it, thought, you know what? Nah, I don't need to do this. It's a waste of my time, energy. So the next morning, I went and told the boss. He goes, right, what have you, what have you decided? And he said, uh, and I said, yeah, I'm not doing the course. And in front of everyone, he stood up and he goes, you think about what you're doing? Because you're making a career decision. What's your answer? What's your final answer? I was like, I'm not doing it. That was the moment my career died. Another pivotal moment. And I was very upset. I was sad. And in fact, every point from there, I woke up sometimes uh, every morning I was crying. Didn't want to go to work. No human on the planet should be ever made to feel like that. But I was. So I didn't know what to do. I'm just a young fellow. I didn't know much. And then I thought, you know, what's going on? And then um, he didn't just leave it there. He would, uh, I would try to transfer to another department in the, in the company because it's a national company and he'd block the transfers. Um, and then what, what he did was, he's a clever guy, eh? he put me on projects that were designed to fail because he needed a scapegoat. Does everyone know what a scapegoat is? Yeah, so a scapegoat is someone you blame, right? So, yeah, so he put me on projects designed to fail because then he could have blamed me, right? And I tried my hardest. I thought, you know what, if I just work longer and harder, I can turn things around. No. None of that happened. It just kept getting worse and worse and worse. So my career was dying. I was so upset. I was depressed. I was crying every morning. You know, and, and my dad's like, you know, why are you crying? You know, this has got no reason. He's your boss. Listen to him. You know, but I didn't know what it was like. You know, I didn't know what I was feeling. I didn't know anything. And then I turned on the TV one day, and I saw Donald Trump's The Apprentice. These days, Trump is not such a great brand or, or a presence. Right? Back in those days, to a young fella, he was like God. Because for the first time ever, I saw young people in business. The world today is very different. Your kids or friends of your kids, you might know some people like really young starting a business. Back when I did it, no one, especially in my hometown, no kid did business. Not like that anyway. But so for the first time I saw, wow, this is, this is cool. And so I would stop going out with my friends. I'd just sit there and watch and I'd learn these business lessons, whatever. And then... So here's my world right now, right? On the one hand, my career is dying. Everyone's upset with me. What's going on? I'm depressed. And on the other side, there's possibilities. And then it got to a point I thought, you know what? Why don't I just start my own business? Why don't I just start my own business? So when I told the boss, quit, and I'll never forget his words. He goes, if you ever pull this stuff again, you never work in this town. I was like, all right, we'll see. And then 
I screwed my business to 13 staff members, as you know, um, won awards for it, and started doing all these projects and whatnot, and I grew the company, and it was, it was great for what it was. But that hunger was still inside me, which is why I always pursued bigger goals. Now, when I started my business, and this is where I'm going with this point, right? When I started my business, I, was, I thought I was an entrepreneur, and I thought I knew a lot of things, and in fact, what I didn't know, I'd go out and seek other knowledge. Uh, from people and mostly books. Does everyone remember Borders Bookstore? Yeah? Do, do you guys remember Borders? Yeah? Borders, yeah. So it was this bookstore. And whenever I'd leave Darwin, right, I'd pack like a couple of shirts, a couple of shorts, you know, but I'd leave this suitcase empty. And I'd go to Borders and I'd buy every book I could on HR, management, project management, marketing, sales, um, you know, how to have negotiation conversations. Right? And I'd come back, right, and mum and dad would be like, what did you buy? What did you buy? Clothes, shoes. Nah, I got all these books. Ah, stupid son. You know, like, that's the world I was in. So I started my company, and, and I thought I was an entrepreneur, but looking back, no, nah, I wasn't an entrepreneur. I was what they call a provider. So for those of you taking notes or whatever, this is what you need to take away. When you start a business, you're at the lowest level, which is the level of the provider, and your focus is only one thing, make a sale. That's the only thing you should need to focus on. Why? Because I see so many people come up with brilliant ideas for business. And then they, they start. And how do they start? They build a website. They um, focus on marketing material. They try and shoot a video. No customers yet. And then I say to them, you know, six, six months down the track, right? I say, I say, how's business going? Oh, it's great. We've got some new business cards. Here, have a card. Here, have a card. Here, have a card. You know, oh, I've got the website up and running. I'm like, cool. No worries. How many clients have you got? Oh, no, no, that'll come later. 12 months down the track, how's business? Oh, mate, it didn't work out. It, uh, I'm, I'm back in my job now. Eh? It's too hard. This business thing's too hard. No, it's not. You're just focusing on the wrong things. So the lowest level is provider. provider. And what do you need to focus on? Why? Survive. survive, yeah, to bring you business. Because if it's not a business, it's just an idea. I have friends who have very secure and stable jobs, and they always talk about these ideas that they have. You know what? I should, I should start this one day. They never do. Then they die. Simple as that. Focus on getting sales. Once you get enough sales, then you move up to the next level, which is the business owner level, where you've got so much demand for your products and services, you need to start hiring staff or you start thinking differently. And at the business owner level, it's all about, it's all about efficiency. How do you make the most efficient sales in the best way possible? How do you build systems, processes, policies, so that when you hire staff, you don't muck around with, with you know, playing games around salary or things like that. It's the business owner level. So what's this level? Yep, and what do you focus on? Next level up. And what do you focus on? Efficiency, great. That's all you gotta do, right? That's all you gotta do. So when I started my business, I was a provider, right? I got, um, got uh, contacts and then I started winning government contracts and you know, I started growing that because I was focusing on sales. Then I moved, I had staff, so I moved into the business owner level. And because I'd established policies and procedures, when an employee came to me with a disagreement, I, I would first say, what's in the policy? And they'd say, oh, I don't know. Check that first, then come talk to me. It's just something so simple, like having a handbook for your business or your organization or your team, for those of you still in an organization, right? Have a handbook, have a rule book, whatever, right? Then abide by it, simple, simple stuff. Right? Then, from that point on, you move to the level that I'm at now, which is the entrepreneur. And at the entrepreneur, it's always about one thing, ideas. Always about ideas. Now, here's where things go wrong, all right? When you're a provider and you start doing policies and procedures and whatever, because that's the business owner level, right, you go wrong. When you're a business owner and you're running around trying to make sales, you're doing it wrong. And this level is where a lot of people go wrong in business. They just haven't got this. Also, another, another thing that happens is, as a provider, you're very good technically. Your technical competency is brilliant because you have some sort of a skill set. Um, so we've got a few IT people in here. Any accountants? Yep, cool. The money boys, great, love it. 
Um, and uh, any lawyers? Thank God. <laughs> None. Brilliant. So I won't get sued today. Brilliant. Um, yeah, so, so whatever your skills are, right? How many of you actually have a business? Fantastic. How many of you want to start a business? Fantastic. Great. And how many of you work for an organization? Beautiful. So nice big mix here. I love it. This is great. So let me show you how all entrepreneurs think because we all think in exactly the same way. Entrepreneurship, to me, is about something so simple. It's about taking an idea and achieving an outcome. Now, if it was so simple, everyone would be entrepreneurs, right? But what happens between the idea and the outcome are these things in the middle called barriers. Now, the good news is, in my 20 or so years of working with this model, not in its current form, but just working with this concept, there's only three barriers you need to pay attention to. The first barrier is your internal barrier. That's that little voice in your head that says, I don't know if I'm good enough. Or what makes you think you can run a multi-million dollar business when your home life is crap? Or what makes you think that you can run a company and negotiate big deals when you put on two different socks today? Or picked up a wrong handbag, <laughs> right? It, it just it messes with you. That internal voice in your head. Those people that have these ideas, they've got an internal voice that says, not yet, enjoy your salary. You have to support your family. Internal voice. So that's the first barrier. You need to build up self-confidence in yourself and your abilities. When you conquer that barrier, the next barrier you're going to face is what I call the external barriers. The external barriers relate to, nine times out of ten, it's about communication. How do you communicate this idea in such a way to get people excited to buy your product or buy your service? It could also relate to finance. Maybe we don't have enough money to start this idea. Maybe we just don't have the budget to do this project. Maybe uh, we're still paying off a lot of debt and we just can't afford it. Financial barriers. Could also be legal barriers because we all know we can make a lot of money doing dodgy things, but we don't. Well, most of us don't anyway. Uh, but yeah, and uh, last year, a couple of years ago, I did an um, international speaking tour in Sri Lanka. And I discovered another external barrier, uh, political barriers, both organizational barriers and uh, government barriers too. So it's a bit of a problem. Uh, another external barrier could be just circumstances, event circumstances. Terrorism is now a real threat. Well, it's always been a real threat, but now it's just more in the Western world than it was before. So, um, you know, these are all external barriers. So when you believe in the idea yourself and you know how to communicate it and conquer down these barriers, the last barrier that you're going to face is sometimes, no matter how good you are internally and externally, your idea will still fail if it's a terrible idea and it's never going to work. Let me give you a quick example. I get a lot of emails and they, people, see my, people see my videos and, um, and they come up and say, AJ, you know, I love your work, I've got this idea, can you give me some feedback on it? And so sure. So one day I get this email. And it's from uh, some person, he calls himself a doctor, I don't know if it's a real doctor or, or whatever, but he, his email says to me, uh, G'day AJ, um, you know, my, I've got an amazing idea that's going to revolutionise the hospitality industry. If you Google the words, I don't know how this actually sounds, right? It might be a different accent. I'm just reading it like an Aussie, right? So I've got, um, I've got this amazing product that's going to revolutionise the, uh, the hospitality industry. Please Google the words perfect poor, as in P-O-U-R, uh, and you will see what I mean. Wink. And I thought, the arrogance of this guy expecting me to go and hunt for his product without telling me what it is and he wants my advice. But I did it anyway because I was kind of curious. So I went and Googled this perfect poor and up came a video. And the product was uh, <laughs> a product that's going to revolutionize the hospitality industry. Was um, 
a, a, a device that you put on top of a wine bottle to stop it from um, spilling, right? And I'd seen so many products like that before. But this one guy, he believed in it. So I watched this video, and it was a before and after video, right? So the first video was, okay, before. So wine bottle, pouring it, um, you know, with, into the glass, pour it into glass, spills everywhere, wrecks the tablecloth. With the product, he pours the bottle, no spillage. Here's the problem. When you take a look at the video, you can see there's a difference in the way he pours it with the device. The angle's changed. So instant credibility, gone. And I tell that story to people that I speak to because it's the perfect example of when you believe in something yourself, so much yourself and your abilities. He believed. And he made a video to communicate it out there to the rest of the world. But he just had a terrible idea and it was never going to work because he didn't do his research or the implementation of that idea. You could take that concept and do amazing things. Like you could maybe sell it for, um, you know, uh, thinking entrepreneurially, you could sell it to um, accountants, make it a special device only for accountants, comes with a calculator. I don't know, right? But you can think about this stuff. Again, different perceptions. So to me, entrepreneurship is really about smashing down barriers. And the more skilled you become as an entrepreneur, the quicker the barriers come down. And every single entrepreneur thinks like this because this is called the entrepreneurial mind. And every single entrepreneur on the planet thinks like this. Who's some of the entrepreneurs that you admire? Yell them out. Elon Musk, yep, go. Richard Branson, who else? Warren Buffett, who else? Keep coming. Gary. Gary. Vayner? Yep. yep, yeah, cool. Who else? Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. Ladies, who do you admire in business? Richard Branson, what about yourself? No idea? All right, cool. That's cool. All right, any female entrepreneurs that you admire? Oprah, Oprah Winfrey, yeah, cool. She's amazing, isn't she? A lot of people think, why is she an entrepreneur? She's got an amazing company. Yeah, you know, hey, you know. Smart, yeah, smart, hey. Every single entrepreneur thinks in terms of like this, right? Uh, Elon Musk, someone said Elon Musk, right? His idea, I want to remove traffic congestion. Outcome, uh, I'm going to dig holes underneath LA. Do you think he'd face a few barriers? He believes in himself. He knows how to communicate the idea, and now he's bulletproofing the idea. So... Part of my work is speaking as well, but I've also got consulting programs and seminars, private seminars, which I'll tell you one about later on. But it's one of, I've got programs that smash down these barriers instinctively. Why? Because the more you develop your entrepreneurial mind, the easier life becomes. The more you develop your entrepreneurial mind, the easier life becomes. Why? Because today, how you think is more important than what you think. How you think is more important than what you think. Let me give you a quick example. Uh, this is a current example. So uh, when I heard, I, I have this belief, right, this insane belief, right, again, that internal barrier, right? I have this insane belief that this, if you take nothing away from this workshop but this, this will unlock an amazing business career life for you. Because I believe using this framework, you could solve any problem. You can solve any problem. And, and so I challenge myself on this, right? Um, recently, I wrote an article about Maya, the retail store Maya. They're in a lot of trouble, a lot of trouble. And so the CEO came on uh, an article and he said, um, you know, I've got the strategy. Um, retail's being disrupted. We're, we need to go digital. We need to develop our digital uh, platforms and experience and everything will be fine. And now's the time to do it. And I wrote, and I thought, you know what? <laughs> That's what Borders thought too. They're not around anymore. It's not about the digital experience, it's about something else. So I wrote a few comments on Twitter and LinkedIn and whatever, and the next day I woke up and the CEO was fired. Not because of me, don't, don't <laughs> get him fired, right? But because I was onto something, entrepreneurial mind, how you think is what, what is more valuable than what you think. So I was thinking about this, and I wrote a couple of, then I wrote a big long article, and then after that, the board chairman jumps on, and he says, um, yes, I want faster turnaround results, and we've got to implement things that are more important, and I'm convinced we've got the right strategy, just we need to execute. And I thought, bye-bye, Maya, bye. 
because they're doing the wrong things. They're doing the wrong things, focusing on the wrong things. And then I got even deeper into the exact challenges. So one of the things that they're doing wrong is they haven't put their customers first, right? That's just one thing I noticed. They haven't put their customers first and they've been doing wrong things for many years. They haven't put their customers first. But the second thing I had no idea on. The second thing is that they locked into all these leases around the country and it's killing them. And one of the biggest challenge is to get out of these leases. But here's the problem. A shopping center, Meyer is, is an integral part of a large shopping center. They're called an anchor tenant. So do you think the shopping center is going to go, oh, sorry, we're feeling your pain. See you later. Blessings. No. They're going to, like, hammer them. Yeah. They're going to hammer them. And so the next CEO is looking at this going, what do we do? Oh, my God. And you know what? I felt his pain. When I heard this, I was like, oh, God, how do you, how do you solve this? I mean, like, uh, you need to get out. You need cash. And then people are going to hammer you. Far out. How do you get out of this? And then I was like that for a few moments, this, this wandering helplessness. right? And I think a lot of people experience that in business. They might not really talk about it because, well, from my culture, we're, we portray um, weakness is a sign of weakness, you know. It's not vulnerability. Vulnerability is not really spoken about where I come from, you know. These days it's all right. You can talk about it, but, you know, so, yeah. So, so I think a lot of people have these problems in business. And then, so I took the night off, and then I woke up the next morning. I thought, you know what? I'm an entrepreneur. I've got a system that works. What if we take that problem and run it through this? And then I did. And I worked out, ah, that's how you solve the problem. Ah, oh, OK, cool. And then I applied more frameworks. And I was like, ah, oh, that's how you do it. Yeah, OK, cool. And all of a sudden, I was happy again. Now, the answers that I came up with might not necessarily be correct, because I don't have enough information. I'm not a part of Maya or anything like that. But I had a way out of this problem. And you need to explore that. Before, the night before, I was freaking out. That's why I say how you think is more important than what you think. Cool. So um, I believe we're at the halfway mark now. Yep, spot on. Great. Now, you all have invested time and energy coming here today. And I want to honor your investment in this room, in me. Because you could be at home sleeping, right? But you're not. You're here. So I want to thank you for, for investing your time in me. So you've heard some stories about me. Now I want to give you some value back to you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn over the presentation to you guys. Don't freak out, right? Don't freak out. And we're going to, um, we're going to play another game, sort of. But you've heard a little bit about my story, my background, my perspective. You've learned about the entrepreneurial mind. So now what I want to do is find out what do you guys want to learn from me in the next 20 or so minutes, okay? So to do this, because there's so many of you, I don't have time to get to each and every one of you, we're going to play a little game, all right? And what we're going to do is we're going to split up into groups where you are, right? And uh, we're going to, um, I'm going to use a technique from the special forces. So the American special forces or any special forces, whenever there's a, a war zone, before it becomes a war, they drop a, a, maybe a five-man team or a six-man team into this area to work with local people. Right? And that's how you get a five-man team scale up to armies of 300, 400 people. Right? So we're going to do that. Okay? So we're going to split up into groups where you are. Right? I'll give you allocations into your groups. And your first job in your group is to pick a group captain. Okay? So... Let's make the group. So maybe if you gentlemen here, one group. Yep. yep. Uh, you guys here, one group. Yep. Uh, you guys here. You got the captain here, so <laughs> it's all good. You guys group. You three and you two. All right. And uh, you know what? Uh, you know what, sir? Could you join that group, please? Yep, that group. Yep. And then um, you guys can be a big group up the back. Yep. Cool. All right, so does everyone have their groups? Yep. Okay, now within your group, your first task is to choose a group leader and that person stand up. Let's go. You've got a minute.
great, 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 great. All right, Captain. All right, cool. Now. <laughs> I love it. I love it. This is great. All right, my captains. I will be dealing with you directly, and you will be dealing with your group. Okay? So, my captains, um, what I want you to do is first of all, I want to salute each and every one of you. So, Woi Brass. Woi Brass. Woi yeah. Woi Brass. Woi Brass. Woi Brass. Woi Brass. Woi Brass. Brilliant. Okay, my captains, here's your job. For the next few minutes, I want you to discuss with your group and come up with one thing that your group would love to know from me. So whatever challenge that could be, a question that you're dying to find out the answer to, and uh, come up with a one question from the group that you'd like to know. And that way we've got five questions and it's up to me to try and give you answers to that. All right, let's go. A couple of minutes. Go. All right. Captain, Hoi Brass. What was your group like to know from me? Uh, we'd like to know exactly as to how do we come out of Mm -hmm. And how do we get out of doubting ourselves? Mm -hmm. Remove self-doubt. Cool. Thank you, Captain. You may sit down. Captain, boy brass. Uh, how, to, yeah, how to get idea into reality? Idea into reality. <laughs> I love it. These are great questions. Yay. Captain, boy brass. Mm -hmm. So, one of the external, between implementing your ideas into an outcome, a uh, way to set that could be a, how to raise your finance for the business. Mm -hmm. So, you want to know how to raise money? Yeah. Mm. Good question. Any ideas? No. <laughs> Captain, where brass? Where brass? What would you like to know? Mm -hmm. We are thinking that how do we reach out to um, as many like-minded people mm -hmm. um, just to um, increase everyone's participation in our event. Engagement? How to increase engagement? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> cool. Thank you, Captain. Captain, Woi Brass. Okay, cool. Buy or start? Mm, that's an interesting question. Cool. All right, thank you so much. All right. Um, this is so exciting. These are great questions. Um, okay, so I want to um, I want to start by looking at. I'm going to start removing self-doubt and then I'm going to go to buy or start because I think the two are related. How do you remove self-doubt? When I... When I was going through my negative environment with my dad and everyone else around me, um, no one told me that what I was doing was correct or that I actually could make it work. So I refused to believe them because I saw it working for other people. So let me give you a concrete example of this. Sir, can you please stand up? Can everyone yell out what color he's wearing? Red. Orange, red, orange. Okay, cool. Could it be brown? Why? Too far from brown, okay. But why though? Why can't it be brown? That's what we were taught. That That's it's the really looks like red or is red and not brown. Right. And what makes you believe that? You said it before. It's reality. It's reality. It's the truth, right? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for sitting down. So likewise, that's how I see the world today. I see things being done and I refuse to accept 
other ways or other possibilities. Okay, so um, I'm going to teach you two things, and I believe this is uh, this is a it's kind of like a hack or a, a tip or a trick. Let's call it a trick, right? That that we can use. Okay, so two techniques. Uh, first one is physical. Um, Sir, can I get you to come out the front, please? Thank you so much. And just stand up here. Okay, cool. Um, all right, the first trick is physical one. Okay. Um, can you tell everyone your name? Surya. Surya. Okay, cool. Um, can you tell everyone who was the uh, second president of the United States? Okay, cool. He was certain, you probably didn't see it, right? But when Surya stands, you know, he's got a natural posture, he's, he's laid back, okay? And my name is Surya. And did you notice that he looked at all of you when he said that? My name is Surya. Yeah? Yeah. But then, <laughs> then when I asked him, who's the second president of the United States? Yeah, I, I don't know, right? It's such a subtle little thing, right? Such a subtle, body language, right? Yeah, yeah. So whenever you have self-doubt, what I do, thank you, Surya, thank you so much. Yeah. Give him a big round of applause, please. Okay, so what I do, right, and this is absolutely insane, right, but it works. So whenever I've got self-doubt, I go and stand in front of a mirror and I look at the person staring back at me, right, and I just look at them and I'll notice the shoulders are forward, the chest is, you know, a little bit drooped and because they don't portray confidence, right, you know, Surya is like a laid-back kind of guy, so he's like, yeah, it's all right, you know, so, so it's cool, right? But if I didn't have confidence in myself and my abilities, what right do I have to sit, stand in front of you today and tell you what I think about the world? You're not going to believe me, you know? So what I do is I look in front of the mirror at the person standing back at me, and I notice how the shoulders, how's the chest, how's the neck, you know, whatever. And this posture here, it's very interesting, right? Um, I'm originally from Darwin and I moved down to Melbourne. This is kind of like a very default posture for Melbourne. You know why? Can anyone guess why? Cold. Because it's cold, <laughs> right? It's cold. So naturally, and you go and have a look when it comes winter time, what do people do? They're, they're huddled up, trying to keep warm, the head scarf and everything, like they're running around like this, right? But when it comes summertime, some of them change, a lot of them don't, right? So. It's interesting. Melbourne's very interesting like that, okay? So this is also like your body is trying to protect yourself. It's a, it's a um, what do you call it, a survival mechanism, right? So I look at the person standing in front of me when I, when I have doubt, right? And then all I do is shoulders back, head up, go right. And I stand like that for a few minutes. And this posture, it's a trick because your body cannot... Um, maintain this posture unless it fires off neurochemicals. Um, I think it's serotonin and I think it's serotonin and oxytocin. I'm a little bit unsure on that, but it fires off the neurochemicals. Where you, if you just stand like this for a while, you, you cannot be anything but confident, right? And then you start thinking about your self doubt, and then slowly, you know, you you you, you know you drop your posture, and then you just got to keep doing that. Now your body is a, a creature of habit. So you've got to keep doing this a lot. So whenever I have self-doubt, I stand in front of, like this in front of a mirror for several days. You might think that's vain. You might think that's an idiot. But it works. Try it. Go home. Right? And this is, not, this is not just a male thing. right? Females, when you, when you walk into a room and you see, um, like, we're, we're, we're all Indian here, um, Indian by association. <laughs> right? When you see a Bollywood movie star come in, is she like, no. She's proud, she's beautiful, she's glamorous, she's glowing. Why? She's built up that confidence, right? So that's a, that's a physical trick that I use, okay? Here's the here's practical trick for you guys. I ask myself, how? I ask myself, how can I make this happen? How are other people doing it? How could I get out of this problem? How, how, how? Instead of, what do I do? <coughs> oh my God, what do I do? It's very different, right? It's very different. That question saved me from my dad telling me, you know, you're nothing, you're useless, whatever, you've got to get the A, otherwise no one's going to listen to you, whatever, right? But I'll be always looking at someone else going like, well, how are they doing it? 
And if they're doing it, how do I do it? That one question will change your career, change your life, whatever you want. So those are two tricks. Yes, sir? Isn't it why rather than how? Because when you, okay, when you ask yourself why, um, say, say you're going through a bad time. Why is this happening to me? The natural reaction is, oh, because I screwed up and I'm an idiot or why, uh, you know. Or if you're going through a great time, why is this happening to me? You don't really care. All right, and when you lose that good time, because the way life works is up and down, nothing's ever constant. Um, I learned that the hard way, <laughs> didn't read that in, <laughs> in university. Um, when you start asking why, you answer that question, well, why is this so? But you don't actually have the empowerment question behind that. You might seek understanding, but not the empowerment side. Does that make sense? Now we're talking, that, but that doesn't relate to, that's not a belief system. That's like, um, that's not a belief system. That's a, um, that's a, a motivational driver. Why? You know, your purpose. Your purpose is a motivational driver. Like, you could be, um, <laughs> I'll give you an example, right? <laughs> There's this video on YouTube, and it's this kid, right? And he's, I don't know, he's a teenager or maybe a university student. And he goes, you know, and he starts talking motivational, right? He goes, I believe in myself. I believe in my abilities. I believe that anything is possible. And you know what? If I believe it, you can do it too. I'm going I'm to break this board, right? So that's his why. He's driven by his why. I'm going to break this board. Duh, ow, duh, ow. The guy does it 20 times. Finally, the board cracks, you know? He's driven by his why, his purpose. I believe it. Everyone else can do it. I can do this too. That's a why belief, right? But he never looked at how can I break this board. He just thought, ah, uh, and then going, ah, uh, and he does it about 20 times. It doesn't work. Ask yourself how and then develop your why. And it's that curiosity. It's that curiosity that drives you to be better. Then you develop your why. Don't get me wrong, right? Why is a very important belief. But you need to ask how. Because the way the mind works, especially if you're a more logical person, um, you'll, you'll come up with answers. It's more empowering than emotional. So, yeah. Um, does that give you ideas on how to remove self-doubt? Yep. We cool? Yell it out. Is that good? Yes. Yep. Cool. Yep, cool. So how to get out of your comfort zone. You are the average of the five people you hang around with the most. Quick answer to that question, get around better people. Go talk to Ben, go talk to Hasha, go talk to other members of the GTO community, right? Ask yourself, how? How do I get out of, how do I get out of my comfort zone? Why do I get out of my comfort zone? Well, I want to. Well, how do I do it? Okay. I, Go talk to other people. Get around the five people. Change your circle up. If you've got that friend that's always annoying and nagging and energy zapping, get rid of them. No disrespect to them. They might be a good person, but we, we only live one life. If it's not working for you, yeah. Because remember, we're thinking like entrepreneurs now. It's different. It's very different. Yeah. No, you're right, man. Come in. Come in. No, don't be sorry. It's all good. Cool. Yep. All right. Um, all right. Now we're cool? Yep. All right, cool. Mm -hmm. If you're earning a good amount of money right now, mm -hmm. you want to do start your own business, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, you have to sacrifice your salary, mm -hmm. and you have to come out exactly. A new Does that relate year. to buy or start? No, no. Okay. Uh, yep. Same one. You have to start your new business. You exactly sacrificing your current salary. Yep. You are out of that. Yep. Starting a new business which you are not tested right now. Yep. And it might be a failure also. Yep. So going from this stage to that stage. Very difficult. Of so course. How to, how to overcome that? Yeah, that's idea into reality. I'll cover it then. Okay, cool. All right, done. All right. Um, so buy or start. Okay. Why would anyone want to buy a business? <coughs> Yell it out. Because what? Sorry. Everything's ready. Yeah, you get it. They're ready to get out. Someone else ready to get in. Uh, sorry. What did what did you? Who was it? That's was it. You that said it? Yeah. Um, what did you say again? <coughs> Everything ready. 
Are you ready, though? That's the difference, right? I, uh, I spend uh, a bit of time uh, actually with um, my, uh, <laughs> he's my, he's my barber, but I call him my landscape gardener because my hair's all over the place, right? So I spend a bit of time with him and, and he's very unhappy earning the money he, he earns. He wants like, you know what? I've saved enough money, I'm gonna go buy a business. Well, why do you wanna buy a business? He goes, some franchise joint, right? And I say, okay, cool. Um, what, makes you, what makes you do that? Oh, because they do all the work for you. <laughs> yeah. It is, it is a myth that just because it's a franchise that they do all the work for you. If you don't have the courage to do it all on your own and you buy a business, you'll end up back in a job real soon. Mm-hmm. Buying a business gives you an avenue where you can start a dot at the bottom line and then enhance it. So Key word there is enhance. Yeah. Do you have the skills and the ability to enhance a business? When you get into the business, yes, obviously there is uh, some learning period initially in the business. And from there on you can start. Because sometimes if you have already some, uh, you know, all the existing connections are there, you can start working on that one. But in, instead of starting up a new, uh, totally a new venture, might land up you in the six months down, mm -hmm. you are existing, mm -hmm. and basically you're buying out your distribution period to buy it. Yep. Also, it depends also like, you know, the valuation at which you're buying. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop you there for a second, right? Very valid point. It, the business has already got contacts, it's already started, there's cash flow, assuming there's cash flow, right? What's the one problem with that? Let's say contacts, existing contacts. What's the one assumption that you shouldn't make? Will the contacts relate to you? Yeah. Uh, give, you give you an example. Now, just remember, this isn't a hard and fast rule, right? If you're an entrepreneurial type and you have cash flow and you're the sort of person that can actually develop a business rather than start it from scratch, you should go ahead and buy a business. Simple as that, right? But let me give you an example, okay? Um, whenever, let's say there's a highly profitable business. On paper, it looks brilliant. You're, you're a um, lot of cash flow. You're an entrepreneur. You just you know, build up clientele, you know how to take systems and the business is not systemized. So there's incredible value, unrealized value in this business. And you go, brilliant, right? But you don't do your due diligence. And one of the most simple things to ask a business owner that you're gonna buy, an existing, let's say an existing business that's uh, not a franchise, but it's got good cash flow, whatever. One of the first questions to ask the business owner, <coughs> something so simple. When the customers come in, who do they ask for? Oh, they asked for me. What do you think is going to happen when that person is no longer there? Then you have to inject time, money, and energy building up a reputation or, um, or keeping that person in the business. And if he's smart, he or she is smart, right? If I was being self-serving, I would be like, yeah, yeah, you pay me some money and I'll hang around, but I'm going to do a terrible job because I know you need me to run this business. It's a risk. Now, if you're the sort of person who knows how to manage all that and you've got so much experience and you're willing to make mistakes and learn from them, go ahead. That's the difference. I believe it depends on what sort of business you're looking at as well. Totally. Uh, if it's a service business, then yes. You yeah. Solve the base comes into the picture. Yeah. But if it's a, let's say, if it's a food industry, let's say somebody, if someone's running a subway store, yep. uh, no matter who's serving me, I know what I want and that's what they're going to do because it's a pretty standard thing that they will do. Mm, a standardized product, that's a good thing. It's also about experience as well, because I've been to Subway stores, I love Subway, like it's really cool. But sometimes I go in there and that spinach doesn't look really fresh, or that steak is so fatty, right? Now that is an indication for me of the management team, right? Subway people who greet me, you know, are they smiley, are they friendly, are they happy, are they high, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, it's an indication. So that's the difference between should you buy a business or should you start it from the scratch, right? Both have benefits, don't get me wrong, but it comes down to you as the entrepreneur. What is your actual skill set? If you are so instinctive in doing this, by all means, turn a business around or add value into it and grow. If you're not, sorry. Yeah, I just gotta make a quick comment. Mm. For people who wanna start a new business, mm. I mean, start starting 
Mm -hmm. You have to learn the basics from... If you've got the mindset to be a learner. Yeah. But if you already exist in business, mm -hmm. a smart entrepreneur, mm -hmm. then buying you for existing businesses is actually a good option because then you get turnkey and make even more money. So I think for... You're a smart man. For new businesses, starting from the ground up is actually not a bad option. Mm. It just depends on who you are as an entrepreneur. Because I know, um, sorry, I'll, I'll come back to you. Um, uh, I know a lot of people that see the money and they don't see the sense behind it, you know. And not everyone's like that, but you need to be honest with yourself. You need to be so damn honest with yourself. And that is a hard thing to do, given that we're all the world that we live in and we live in pressure and all that. Um, sorry, sir? No, I was just uh, relating to the two concepts you have discussed, perception mm -hmm. and being uh, proceed, uh, Process? Yeah, business owner, yep, and, and um, business owner and yeah, entrepreneur, yep. And so if, if someone's running a business and mm -hmm. they're buying the same franchise, mm -hmm. they are business owners already. Mm -hmm. So buying makes sense to them. Mm -hmm. It's not really a startup. Yeah. So they are business owners. It does, they have yeah. No perception that they are going to run the same thing. So I think it relates to what you what we spoke about. Totally. Uh, it's not a base, what was that word? Uh, pro uh, provider. Provider, provider. Not yeah. Provider. They're not a provider, yeah. You need to come in as the mindset of a business owner. Excellent point, yeah. Um, all right, so buy or start, does that cover it? Yep, cool, thank you. All right, um, ladies and gentlemen, I've only got five minutes left. Ben, how would you feel if we just ran a little bit over time? Is that, is that okay? Would that be okay? Yep. Yeah. You sure? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, guys. All right, um, all right so now, here's how we do it. These three, all in one. Um, Okay, cool. So, yep, yeah, sweet. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. Um, all right, so idea into reality. All right, let's say we have an idea. Here's how I develop it, right? Uh, any idea? First thing I do, what are my barriers? What are the barriers to coming into it? Uh, let's say someone wants to... Uh, actually, let's use a live example. Give me a live example. Someone wants to start a business. Anyone? Start a business. Yes. What, what do you want to start? Um, I want to start a research company. Fantastic. Love it. Okay. So that's the idea. What, do you know what your business is going to look like? Yes. It would be a third-party research-based company for a multinational organization. Any particular specialization in the industry? Biomedical engineering. Beautiful. Why biomedical engineering? Because I'm studying biomedical <laughs> I love it. Cool. I love it. Okay. Cool. Internal barriers. Do you have any self-confidence, um, concerns, or anything like that? Do you believe in this idea? I believe in the idea. The only internal barrier that maybe would be lack of technical knowledge, because it's an ever-growing field with new and new technologies coming in. So I might... No one person can cover all the aspects of it. Bingo. Right, so you're honest enough to recognize that, okay? So, done. You believe in yourself, but you know I don't have enough technical knowledge, and there's a bit of self-doubt in that. So how would you solve that problem? And yep. then second part would be hire a team or set up a team of co-founders that can cover each and every part. You got it. Cool. Would that remove your self-doubt? It would not remove it completely, but it would help me sort of assert the point that, okay, I have a team that stands firm on the belief that the company is made on. Yeah, cool. Brilliant. And so this is a great platform for that. What, sorry? Leverage. This is the platform for mm. to leverage on each other's strength. Oh, totally. And yeah, that's brilliant, right? So, yeah, um, external barriers. What external barriers do you think you're going to face? First would be government regulations. Yep. Second would be existing competitors. Yep. And third would be the finance involvement. Yep, cool. Brilliant. So he's already thought of that. And you develop strategies to come up with it, right? To be honest with you, this is the hardest bit that we're doing. Because a lot of people jump straight into the outcome, set up their bro brochures, marketing and everything. They don't think about all this other stuff, right? Then we got the idea, okay? Do you know exactly what the idea is? Yeah. Good. Are you willing to test it? Yeah. That's another mistake a lot of people don't do. They jump straight in, ah, oh, it's failed, ah, oh, time to go back to the job. He's willing to test it. And testing means going out to market, ah, this idea doesn't work. I'll try something else, or uh, it's called a pivot in the industry. We pivot over to a different idea, change, test, retest, retest, until you find something that works, then you scale, right? 
So when you do that, you run through that process, now all of a sudden you've got an idea, a tangible idea for a business, and then it's testing, 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 right? So that is essentially how do you turn an idea into reality. Now, for those of you already in a job and you want to start a business, right, do not give up your job, right? Do not give up your job, okay? There's this stupid theory out there that says, you know what, I'm an entrepreneur, I have to burn all my bridges, and then that way I'm going to take the island. No, that's a dumb way of doing it, okay? It's completely dumb. Be smart about this stuff. Keep your job, keep your income so you don't have to worry about bills. And then how you do it is you, you micro-develop the idea. So, for instance, you're still at uni? Yeah. Would you give up uni and start this business? No. Okay. But you've got some spare time to work on this? That's how you do it. You use spare time. Then the common concern is, oh, I don't have any spare time. I've got family, I've got responsibilities, I've got to play sport, I've got to watch TV, you know. Nah. You should stay in that job. You can always find one or two hours, even if it's just a week, one or two hours a week to work on this thing. And then you explore it. Using this framework, you explore it. And then this will give you ideas on what you don't know or what you need to do. This becomes like a to-do list. Like you said, right, um, I don't, uh, have you run businesses before? I've done one. Okay, one business, yeah. Um, so, you know, you've got lessons from that business, yeah. Then you're like, well, I don't know any um, co-founders or anything like that, so I'll need to work out how my co-founders. You build up a to-do list and then you work through the list. Does that make sense? Cool, all right. Idea into reality. How to raise money. Oh, I love this. Okay. Um, you may or may not like this answer, but um, people pay money. Money is an exchange. Money is an exchange, right? And it's driven by value. So, for instance, um, I love my cars. <laughs> I'm a huge sports car fan. Um, but my budget at the moment doesn't allow for me to buy a million dollar sports car yet. So, in my head, well, forget I'm an entrepreneur, right? In my head, I'm thinking um, I, would, I, I would never pay a million dollars for that. Some people think like that. I would never pay a million dollars for a car. But not everyone thinks like that. Somewhere, somehow, someone is buying that car because they see value in it. I don't know if I'd ever buy a million dollar car. I don't know, I might, right? But someone sees value in that. They might not be paying a million dollars for it, but you know, they see value. Here's the thing, let me ask you this question. What is more valuable, a diamond or a bottle of water? What's more valuable? Water? Depends on circumstances, you guys get it. And when you start thinking about value in terms of that concept, it unlocks so many opportunities. One of the things that blow my mind, and it's an idea that I'm obsessed with because I don't know how to, I don't know what I'm going to do with this idea, but I'm obsessed with it. There's a famous story of um, a violinist, and he's got a Stradivarius violin, and he goes down to the subway and he plays. He can barely make... 15, 20 dollars. No one cares anything about him. People just walk on by. But this guy is one of the world's greatest violin players and his concerts sell out stadiums for thousands and thousands of dollars. Same guy, same violin, same skills, different environment. Why is that? Audience, Audience perception. Harder to get. What are we talking about? Environment. Environment starts with V. We just spoke about it. Value. Value. I'm obsessed with this idea. How does that work? Why is it's the same guy, but it's a different environment? Value, right? So coming back, how do you raise money? You've got to be valuable to the right people. Five minutes? Cool. Thanks. All right. Um, you've got to be valuable to the right people. And when you truly understand this question of value, that'll tell you how to raise money. 
So it's not just about jumping on Kickstarter. They're all the mechanisms. Once you understand value, you'll get to it, okay? Cool, all right, how to raise money. Increase engagement, all right, again, that's value. That is value too. Because, um, let me give you an example, right? Um, phenomenal. I walk down the street here in Melbourne, and, um, and I've only been recognized once. I've been here for nine years, I've only been recognized once, right, on the subway. Uh, not the subway, uh, what's it called, the train, right? And the guy comes up to me and he goes, oh my God, this is so good to meet you. And I'm like, yeah, cool, man. This is great. Um, you know, this is, this is really cool. So good to meet you. Yeah. So how are things in Canberra? And I'm like, oh, you think I'm the other guy that you met, eh? <laughs> <laughs> so interesting, right? Um, but that sort of engagement only happens when that person is impacted in such a way to engage. And the other reason, and I'll tell you, I'll let you in on a little secret, right? Um, you know when I, um, you know when I uh, did the Woibrus thing at the start? All of you stand up for a second. All of you stand up. Sit down if you've ever seen any other speaker. You've come to an event like this. Sit down if you've seen any other speaker do Woi Brass. No one. Because that's my thing. Thank you. Thank you for the demonstration, right? That's my thing. When you are so valuable and you build up trust with people, and the thing that I do it, it is the best brand building exercise. And whenever I speak, and I might not recognize your faces, but you all recognize mine. And when you come up to me, one of the first things you'll say is Woi Brass. It's, that's branding, that's engagement, that's value. So if you want to increase engagement, specifically, let's get tactical for a second here. If you want to increase engagement, right, find out what is valuable to your members. And if they're not willing to tell you, then you start the process of experimentation. Sometimes people don't know what they value. Start the process of experimentation. Start the process of seeking what other people do through engagement. Whenever you see great engagement on tactical level, Facebook posts, what made this post so engaging? How did these people do it? Does that make sense? Cool. All right, I've got to close off now. So um, I want to tell you a very, very quick story in two minutes. Once upon a time, I was uh, in Darwin speaking at my former high school, and this kid came up to me, and he was about 14 years old, and he said, AJ, I love what you say. You're amazing. Can I have a job? I was like, nah. And he goes, well, can I get a photo? And I was like, yeah, sure, I'll take the photo. So he stood next to me, we took this photo. And that was a pivotal moment for me. Because that photo changed my life and changed his life, too. So a few months later down the track, this guy's teacher rings me up and says, hey, listen, do you remember Robert? I was like, no, who's Robert? That kid you took the photo with? Oh, yeah, I remember him. He's failing school, and all he wants to do is get a job. He's 15 years old, and he can't get a job in IT. No one will give him a chance. Do you have anything for him? I said, no. But you know what? I remember this kid. I'm going to go chat to him. And I said to I go meet up with Robert, and I say, what's your problem, man? You don't look like the dumbest kid around. Why are you struggling at, at school? And he said, well, it's like this, AJ. For maths, they take me out to the beach, and they give me a compass and a map, and they ask me to find my way back into the classroom. And I say, why are you struggling with that? He's like, for the last six years, I've been in junior police ranges where they drop me in the forest and get me to find my way back to camp. And instantly, I knew what the problem was. The traditional education system is not keeping up to his actual ability. And he's bored, he's labeled a disengaged student, a D student, a delinquent, and he's failing school because of that. He's being punished because he's smarter than what he's being taught. That fundamental problem appears everywhere in society today. Everywhere in society today. And it doesn't need to be like that. That's why this work as an entrepreneur is so important. To develop your entrepreneurial mind, that's the only way forward. Given the world disruption and change, everything you know as life today is going to change. 
Very simple like that. Fast forward a bit later, so Robert comes to work for me, I give him a chance, and he builds my training center. We go on to train 160 business owners. Everything's cool. The guy's about 16 now, and his last day working with me. And he says, uh, and he's got to go back to school, right? So I say to him, you know, champ, you seem a little bit down. He goes, yeah, AJ, um, I would like to let you know that I would like to continue working with you. And I was like, sorry, man, can't do it. Back to school. Oh. So he went back to school, starts failing, right? I'm like, teacher rings up, come on board again. You know, so I'm like, all right, come on board, right? But this time, it's a different Robert. Now he's cocky. He thinks he's all that. Because whatever reasons. I built a training center with a cool guy, you know, whatever. Um, so I fired him, <laughs> right? Got rid of him. I don't have time for that. I don't like that attitude. And he disappears, right? Then I see this tweet six months down the track, and he goes, you know what? Um, this tweet said, um, I used to work for one of, one of the greatest business leaders that I've ever met, and I never understood what he was talking about. Now I do. Thank you, AJ. So I was like, ah, cool, sweet. And then he comes to see me. He's about 16 and a half now. He comes to see me. And he says, I say to him, hey, champ, how's it going? And he goes, yeah, good. I just came to tell you something. I'm like, what do you want to tell me? And he's like, I just signed my 100th client. And I was like, what? How did you sign 100 clients? And he goes, well, funny story. You know how, we're all friends here, so I'll tell you. He smokes. And one day, he went to buy his cigarettes from uh, the service station. And he couldn't, they couldn't sell it to him. Not because he's underage, but because his machines were down. And he couldn't actually sell it to him. Now, Robert's in IT. So what he did was he fixed the machine. And he bought his cigarettes. A couple of days later, he goes back again. And the service station says, hey, you know that problem that I had? That bakery in the shopping center has that same problem. Maybe you'd like to go and, and talk to them. He's like, OK. So he goes and he fixes every single shop with this FPOS system in, in the place. And he signs 100 clients. And I thought, my god, this is amazing. Fast forward a few years. Now he's about 18 years old. I catch up with him for lunch. And while the, while the phone is on the desk, right, it keeps buzzing. I'm like, what's going on, man? You got some girlfriends or what? He goes, nah, man, they're clients. I'm like, clients? I thought, you know, your business manager was handling them. Nah, 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 this is a new business. I'm like, what new business? What the hell? You know? And, and he goes, yeah, you know, stupid me broke my phone. And then I went to the shopping center to get it fixed. And they were going to charge me 300 bucks. I don't have 300 bucks, man. I'm just 18. So I jumped on eBay and I found a kit for like 100 bucks and I fixed my phone. And then stupid me put it on Facebook. And now I've got all these people wanting me to fix their phone. It's annoying. And I said, all right, champ, well, okay, you, you're making some money out of it? He goes, yeah, about two grand. I said, two grand, is that like a, a, a month? Uh, like, he goes, no, nah, about a week. And I'm like, is that profit or revenue? And he goes, what's the difference? <laughs> Fast forward now, right? Fast forward a few years later. Now he's about 20 years old. I say to him, champ, what are you doing? He's like, I'm off to South Korea. I'm like, why are you going to South Korea? He goes, AJ, there's the world's, um, world's seminar or world's expo of electronic games, e-games, right? And AJ, that's a $30 billion industry. If I could just get a slice of that, I'd be laughing. I'm like, cool, champ. Great. No worries. Good luck. Few few months later, um, I get a phone call from Robert, and he knows not to ring me because I don't do phone calls, right? So I know it's a pretty big deal. So he rings me up, and I chat to him, and I said, "Hey, um, hey, what's going on, champ?" And he goes, "Listen, I'm I, I'm going through a lot of terrible trouble, and um, I've got pressure from my girlfriend now, and I, I have to give up, and I have to get a job, and I just really wanted to let you know because I didn't want to let you down." And I was like, champ, you know what? You ain't letting me down. You know, because entrepreneurs do whatever it takes to get stuff done. So if you want to get a job or you need to get a job, you have my blessing, brother. I always got your back. Go do amazing things. He goes, thank you so much. So a few months later, <laughs> I catch up with Robert. And uh, I say to him, how's the job going? And he goes, well, funny story. And I say, what? And he goes, he goes um, well, you remember the thing you said about entrepreneurs do whatever it takes? And I said, yeah. He goes, well, I had a look at my business and I realized that you know, it has value in there. So I actually ended up selling it. I'm like, what? So what are you doing now? What are you doing now? And he goes, yeah, funny story. The people I sold it to, they don't know how to run it. So they hired me back as a CEO. 21-year-old <laughs> CEOs. And I share that story with each and every one of you because here is a kid who knew nothing but he had a deep desire to do amazing things and no one would give him a chance. I gave him a chance because I used to be that kid.
And together we did amazing things, which is a story for another time. But the reason why I tell you that story is all of us here in the room today, we're like Robert. We have ideas, we have beliefs, we have circumstances, we have challenges. But anything is possible if you think like an entrepreneur. And that is what I want to leave you with today. Think like an entrepreneur. Go out there, make the world a better place. Because you can, you all can. If you invested a few hours with me this morning, I know what you're capable of. So go make it happen. And do not, for God's sakes, do not die wondering, should have done that. Thank you, everyone. My name is AJ Kalatanga. It has been deeply honored to be with you. Thank you. Thank you.